Assalamu alaikum. <clears throat> so I'm just going to wait a little bit for you guys to log on, inshallah. And we'll start. Seems like we always start with a weak connection, so hopefully, inshallah, how the connection will get better as well. So as you guys can hear, my voice is, my throat's not the best, so I apologize. I'm getting, starting a little late today, but the connection starts off weak as usual. All right, good. I know I'm late. Alaikum <laughs> salam. So, uh, before we get started, my daughter May wants, wants me to show you guys this. So she, she wants me to show you guys all the, the drawings and the paintings <laughs> she's done for me. So this is what the wall of my office looks like. That's her Ramadan Mubarak. So, yeah. <clears throat> all right. <laughs> so thank you, May. For all the wonderful drawings. All right, all right. So we're in just seventeen now. Bismillah, alhamdulillah, salatu wassalamu ala rasulillah wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wala. So just seventeen, inshallah ta'ala. We're going to start now with Surah Al Anbiya, and we're going to move on now to Surah Al Hajj. Um, last week we we left off, and, and really you know, or yesterday, not last week. Yesterday we left off talking about the story of Musa alayhi salam in Surah Taha as it relates to Surah Taha. So the story of Musa alayhi salam was really to to uh, to reaffirm the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam and to give the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam a level of hope and a level of um, you know a, a level of determination and confidence as he was going to face what he was going to face alayhi salatu wasallam and keep in mind that the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam had not yet faced the worst of the reaction that he got from the people of Mecca because Surah Taha was early on in Mecca. So it was to give the Prophet some the preparation that he needed uh, as he was about to face a much nastier phase in, in the Seerah in Mecca. So it, it ended off with sort of Musa and, um, and, and the different ways that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protected Musa alayhi salam. And then you have now in Juz 17, Surah Al-Anbiya. And Surah Al-Anbiya is actually called the Prophets. It's called Al-Anbiya. For a few for for a few reasons, the first one obviously is that it is a surah that mentions the stories of multiple prophets. So it doesn't center around Hud or Maryam or Yunus or Yusuf alayhim salam, but instead it it goes over all of these different prophets. So Surah Al Anbiya actually covers seventeen different prophets. <clears throat> so Surah Al Anbiya is known as the surah of prophets. It's also Makki. And in Mecca, the stories of the prophets were not yet given in, in any level of detail. So Surah Al-Anbiya is particularly unique within a Mecca context. In the Meccan context, usually the surahs focused on the belief in Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They focused on the belief in the hereafter. But Surah Al-Anbiya actually takes multiple, multiple prophets and gives us detailed accounts of those prophets. And the way that Surah Al-Anbiya starts off is very powerful. اِقْتَرَبِ لِلنَّاسِ حِسَابُهُمْ وَهُمْ فِي غَفْلَةٍ مُعْرِضُونَ That, uh, that the, the accountability, the day of judgment, keeps on coming closer to us while people remain in their heedlessness and they're pushing further away. So as the day of judgment gets closer, <clears throat> people get further away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and further away from the revelation. So it's, it's sort of the irony of the situation. And if you guys get a chance, I posted the khatira that I did last night at the masjid, um, which are the things that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala concealed from the prophets and conceals from us, and how Allah tests our hastiness. Because Allah says in Surah Al-Anbiya, خُلِقَ الْإِنسَانُ مِنْ عَجَلِ That man has been created very hasty. So this surah really you know, talks about the importance of, of not being hasty and how Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala carries out His plan when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sees fit. So it, it, we go back to the prophets though, right? The story of the prophets. And this is what's emphasized within the surah 
over and over and over again. So the Prophet obviously is being accused of being a false prophet. And this is a surah that gives us the details of many of those prophets. And in, in the fifth verse of the surah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala talks about the way that they, they make a mockery of the message. So each one comes with a different possibility. And they don't really care how they're going to disprove the message. The point is they want to disprove the message. So they will employ every argument that they possibly can against the Prophet ﷺ, whether they believe it or not, whatever they feel like is going to be effective in taking the people away from him. So in verse 5, um, So they, you know, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says how first they said that the revelation is just false dreams. The Prophet ﷺ is just imagining things. He's just um, fantasizing. And then they moved on and they said, um, rather he's invented it, بَلْ افْتَرَاهُ So he's completely making it up. And then they said, بَلْ هُوَ شَاعِرُ Rather he's a poet, right? Or they said that he's a sorcerer, they said he's a magician. The point is, is that they jumped from argument to argument against the Prophet wasallam, And subhanAllah, they really didn't settle on one. The point was that they wanted to find an effective way to crush the message and to prove that he wasn't a prophet. But every one of those attacks uh, was proving to be insufficient. So they came up with all of these different things uh, to disprove the Prophet So that's the first one, that they jumped from where the message came from. So was it his false dreams? Was he fantasizing? Was he making it up? Was he just uh, putting together uh, some poetry? <clears throat> and then in verse 8, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala addresses yet another claim. So one of the ways that they attacked the Prophet ﷺ, or they tried to disprove that he was a prophet, was not just questioning the source of the revelation, the source of the Qur'an, but they said, مَالِ هَذَا الرَّسُولِ يَأْكُلُ الطَّعَامُ وَيَمْشِي فِي الْأَسْوَاقِ They said, what is it with this prophet? He, you know, he, he walks in the marketplaces, he eats food like we do. What is it with this prophet being a human being? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَا جَعَلْنَاهُمْ جَسَدًا that, that we did not make prophets before, um, you know, that, that, that except that they were human beings, except that they used to eat their food, and except that they used to use the restroom. And they were not eternal beings. So all of the prophets that came before were exactly like the Prophet ﷺ in that sense. So the first questioning is to the nature of the revelation. The second questioning is to the nature of the Prophet ﷺ himself, that if he is a prophet, then how come he's so human? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, well, this is the way that all of the prophets before were sent. Then they question what the Prophet Sallallahu is calling to. So the claim that they're making <coughs> is that the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam is calling to a divisive message. It, you know, he's, he's turning people against their families. He's turning people against their ancestors. He's turning people against the idols that they've been dedicated to for so long. So if you, if you move on to verse uh, 25, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says that every single prophet was sent with the exact same thing, the essence of the message of every single prophet. Uh, that we did not send before you except for messengers. And we inspire to those messengers, La ilaha illallah. So every single prophet that came before preached the same message of the oneness of God. There were differences in some of the rituals, there were differences in the jurisprudence, but every messenger was preaching the exact same message, أَنَّهُ لَا إِلَهَ إِلَّا أَنَا فَاعْبُدُونَ That verily there is only one God, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is one, and everyone should dedicate themselves in worship to that one God. So again, to recap, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala refutes them when they say that, that, that this is not revelation, when they question the source. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala refutes the idea that the Prophet should be some sort of supernatural human being because all of the Anbiya, many of whom will be mentioned in Surah Al-Anbiya, all of the Prophets who will be mentioned in the Surah, they all had the exact same being. None of them were supernatural. They all died. They all used to eat and drink like regular human beings. And that was so that they could serve as an example. The wisdom of Allah in allowing these Prophets to be human is that they could serve as role models and examples and manifestations of the divine revelation that they are bringing. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala um, you know, uh, refutes the idea that the Prophet is calling to something different than what the other prophets before him called to. 
So he's calling to the exact same message historically as Abraham, as Moses, as David, as Jesus, as as each and every single one of these anbiya, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala send his peace and blessings upon them all. So the Prophet وسلم, is not unique in his message. He's not unique in his being to the other prophets, that means. He is as the prophets came before. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in verse 41, وَلَقَدْ اِسْتُهْزِئَ بِرُسُلٍ مِنْ قَبْلِكَ فَحَاقَ بِالَّذِينَ سَخِرُوا مِنْهُمْ مَا كَانُوا يَسْتَهْزِئُونَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, بِهِ يَسْتَهْزِئُونَ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and every prophet that came before you was mocked. Every prophet that came before you went through the same ridicule. When Abraham came, they ridiculed him with the same things. When Moses came, they ridiculed him with the same things. So Allah is basically comforting the Prophet and saying that every prophet was criticized in the exact same way and ridiculed in the exact same way. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala eventually gave those prophets victory. So just like the prophets before, you will be ridiculed. And just like the prophets before, you will be given victory. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chooses to focus on some of the particular stories of the prophets. And all of these prophets that Allah focuses on, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala focuses on the struggle. And this is a means of, of uh, emboldening the prophets, وسلم, as Allah does when he mentions the stories of prophets within a Mecca context. And each one of these prophets that Allah mentions has a unique lesson that is highly relevant to the Prophet ﷺ at the time. So first Allah starts off with the story of Ibrahim ﷺ. You know, the Prophet ﷺ is being ridiculed. Look at Ibrahim ﷺ. At least the Prophet ﷺ has a handful of followers. At least the Prophet ﷺ has some people that believe in him. You know, look at Ibrahim ﷺ who came before you when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, sent him with the message and his father rejected him, his family rejected him, his entire city rejected him. He didn't even have that handful of followers. Not only that, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions the very painful moments in which Ibrahim islam was stripped and then thrown into a fire, right? But Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protected him. So basically the persecution that you are facing other prophets have faced that persecution before. The persecution you're facing, other prophets have faced that persecution before. And the torture of Ibrahim Islam, the, the persecution that Ibrahim Islam faced uh, came in the form of painful you know, punishment as well as abandonment from his people. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions Lut salam, the prophet Lut. The people of Lut were not aggressive with Lut salam the way that the people of Ibrahim Islam were aggressive with him. They were aggressive with Lut salam in another way, okay? But they mocked Lut salam. they rejected Lut salam. they were arrogant with Lut salam. they, uh, you know, they, 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 uh, they forced themselves upon Lut salam and upon the family of Lut salam. they tried to force themselves upon them. So the, 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 the ridicule that Lut salam faced was of a different nature than the ridicule that Ibrahim salam faced Nevertheless, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saved Lut alayhi salam just like he saved Ibrahim alayhi salam. So Allah saved Ibrahim from the fire and Allah saved Lut alayhi salam from his nation. Nuh alayhi salam, who struggled for 950 years. Now realize that if you're in Mecca now, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions particularly the, the struggle of Nuh alayhi salam for 950 years in Surah Al Anbiya. Realize if you're in the end of Mecca now, you're very prone to bitterness. So look, we've been calling to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala for over a decade, and all we have is the small handful of followers. Well, look at Nuh alayhi salam, who called for 950 years, and he had you know, uh, the same number of followers that you have after a decade, if not less, right? So don't be impatient because Nuh alayhi salam had all of that, right? All of that time, and the amount of followers that he was able to gather was even less than the amount of followers that you are able to gather. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions Dawood and Sulaiman alayhim salam And subhanAllah, the ulama mentioned here, the hikmah of mentioning Dawood and Sulaiman, David and Solomon, is that they were kings. But despite the fact that they were kings and they had control, they had authority, that did not stop them from being challenged and from finding obstacles in this dunya and from having to, you know, having to maintain the message and maintain firmness in the face of many obstacles. So even Dawood and Sulaiman, despite having Khazan al-Ard, despite having the kingdom of the world, 
even they had to face obstacles and they had to face rejection and they had to deal with what they had to deal with. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, in the last two mentions of prophets that we have <clears throat> in Surah Al-Anbiya, I'm sorry, I'm really struggling guys. Make dua for me inshallah. <laughs> the last two prophets that we have are Ayyub alayhi salam and Yunus alayhi salam. Now Ayyub alayhi salam was tested in regards to his personal well-being. So Ayyub alayhi salam was tested with illness. He was tested, so the loss of health, the loss of wealth, his family, you know, was taken away from him. So Ayyub alayhi salam was, was, you know, was really tested in his own personal life. It wasn't his da'wah life, his, his life in calling to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but it was really his personal life. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala focuses on that. And subhanAllah, we don't find much about Ayyub's people in the Qur'an, right? If I, we don't find anything about them. All we really find is the test of Ayyub alayhi salam on a personal level. Why? Because that's the lesson to the Prophet ﷺ. Because the Prophet ﷺ would be tested on a personal level as well. He wouldn't just be rejected by his people. He would lose Khadija radiallahu ta'ala anha. He'd lose Abu Talib. His children would pass away alayhi salatu salam. So just like Ayyub alayhi salam lost all of his children, the Prophet ﷺ lost six of, 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 of seven. Ayyub alayhi salam was tested in many ways on a personal level. And the Prophet ﷺ was tested in many ways on a personal level. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala saw Ayyub alayhi salam through those difficulties. And he saw the Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam through those difficulties as well. Yunus alayhi salam was tested by his people. So Ayyub was tested on a personal level. Yunus was tested at a community level. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam was tested with both. Right? So Ayyub alayhi salam was tested with his personal well-being. Yunus alayhi salam tested with the rejection of his people. The Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam was tested with both. In both of these situations, Ayyub alayhi salam and Yunus alayhi salam, both of them found comfort in du'a. Both of them found that, uh, that, that victory and help came from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala in the form of du'a. So when they both called upon Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah relieved them, He pardoned them, He forgave them, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala rewarded them for the struggle that they faced. So this is a, a really a, a very powerful message to the Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam and to the believers in this state as they're very prone to bitterness with everything that's going on, but they're still maintaining, especially the Prophet Sallallahu he's maintaining a sense of steadfastness, and Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala telling the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam not to be hasty, not to, not, to, uh, not to rush, and the believers not to be hasty, and not to rush. Now SubhanAllah, the next surah is Surah Al-Hajj, and Surah Al-Hajj goes back to a Medina context. And some of the scholars say that the first that the first half of Surah Al-Hajj, the first uh, the first portion of Surah Al-Hajj, was revealed in Mecca, and the majority of the surah, the, the second, the, the last two thirds of the surah, were revealed in Medina, or they were all it was all re revealed in Medina. The point is is that this is the beginning of the Prophet Sallallahu arrival in Medina. The Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi has just got to Medina, and Subhanallah, you know. The, the background of the surah is Hajj, which is amazing because they were in Mecca all these years and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not reveal to them about the Hajj. Why now when they've moved to Medina? And it's in the beginning of the Medina, so it's not even, it's not even close to the era in which they're going to be able to do Umrah and Hajj. The Prophet ﷺ would not be able to do it for another nine years. So why now? Why is a surah of Hajj being revealed now? So what happens, subhanAllah, you can imagine the mindset the Muslims have moved from Mecca to Medina. This is the first year in the lives of the Muhajireen and the lives of the Mecca that they are not witnessing the Hajj around them. Why? Because there was a Hajj in Jahiliyyah. There was still a pilgrimage in the days of ignorance. But of course, it involved idols and idol worship and so on and so forth. But this is the first year that they're being forced to see this from, from outside in. They're, no, they're not in Mecca, and it's not like they have TVs where they can watch the tawaf and they can watch the, you know, the Hajj procession taking place. This is the first time they are disconnected from that environment altogether. And you can imagine the pain that they're feeling knowing that the month of the Hijjah has come and they are completely disconnected from the Kaaba, they're completely disconnected from the Hajj, and here they are in this new land of Medina. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala really, you know, He reveals this, this surah as a surah of hope. And it's interesting because in the last surah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala warns us against being hasty. And in this surah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is giving the Muslims a promise 
that they would return to Mecca and they would return to do Hajj, but Allah does not tell them when, right? So don't be hasty. You will one day make it back to Mecca and you will one day make it to do Hajj. So don't be hasty. And SubhanAllah, this is in the very, very beginning of the Madani period as they've come to, as they've come to this new land of theirs. So SubhanAllah, they're feeling the sadness and Allah is telling them that you will do Hajj, you will come back to this house and when you do come back to this house, it's, it's going to be better than when you left it. It's going to be purified from the idols. It's going to be Hajj in the way that Ibrahim السلام, did Hajj. Now, uh, if you look at Surah Al-Hajj, the very first two verses of Surah Al-Hajj are a response to the first verse of Surah Al-Anbiya. So Surah Al-Anbiya talks about the rapid coming of the hour and how people are avoiding paying attention um, to, to the hour. Right? In this surah, Surah Al Hajj, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Ya yuhan nasu taqu rabbakum inna zalzalata sa'ati shay'un azim. O oh, oh mankind, fear your Lord and be dutiful to him. Verily, the, the earthquake of the hour is a terrible thing. So recognize that things are going to come to you. SubhanAllah. So the last surah is that look, you know, don't, don't allow yourself to become heedless of the day of judgment. Here Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, be mindful of the day of judgment. The opposite of, of taqwa is ghafla, heedlessness. So taqwa is, is a heightened state of awareness. Ghafla is a heightened state of heedlessness, being in a complete state of slumber and heedlessness. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is saying, you know, be, you know, think about the day of judgment. Realize that the hour is coming. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, يَوْمَ تَرَوْنَهَا تَذْهَلُ كُلُّ مُرْضِعَةٍ عَمَّا أَرْضَعَتْ Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, on that day you will see every nursing mother be distracted from the child that she was nursing. And, she, and, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, kullu dhati hamlin hamlaha. And you would see that the, the, the pregnant woman would abort her pregnancy. So the pregnant woman would miscarry. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَتَرَى nasa sukara. And you would see the people as if they are intoxicated. وَمَا هُمْ بِسُكَارَ But they are not intoxicated, they're not drunk. وَلَكِنَّ عَذَابَ اللَّهِ شَدِيدٌ But rather the, uh, the, the punishment of God is severe. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is mentioning the state of chaos and havoc on the Day of Judgment. People running around, people trying to figure out you know, what, they're, what they're doing, people wondering what's happening, right? Because they didn't prepare themselves for that day. So in this, in this uh, world, in this life, Allah is mentioning in Surah Al-Anbiya, people have dulled their senses. They've purposely tried to ignore the hour and put themselves in a state of heedlessness. Now in Surah Al-Hajj, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala starts off by talking about the consequences of that heedlessness and how people are on the Day of Judgment, where suddenly uh, people are in this complete state of shock, trying to figure out where they are, trying to figure out what to do with themselves, and so on and so forth. And so SubhanAllah, in the, you know, the next stage of the Surah is very interesting. In Surah Al-Anbiya, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls our attention to the creation of the heavens and the earth, the sun and the moon. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala even references the Big Bang in, in Surah Al-Anbiya, uh, Al that, you know, that everything coming together and then being split by the permission of Allah. Allah mentions the seas, Allah mentions the mountains. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions all of these different, uh, you know, all of these different types of, uh, of, of creations around us that's, that show Allah's existence and prove Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's creation and control, right? That Allah is in control. Now you look at this this other side of things, right? And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls us to the creation of ourselves. In Surah Al-Hajj, the focus is on the creation of ourselves. And this is an argument that's made in Quran uh, quite frequently. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bil afaq wa fi anfusihim. That we will show them our signs in the highest, in the furthest horizon, and even within themselves. So the focus in Surah Al-Anbiya is in the horizon, is looking around you and recognizing the magnificence of the creation of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and seeing all of this around you as a proof of God. Now Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells you to focus on yourself. So verse 5, if you were to actually um, to, to, to Google or search the Qur'an and embryology, right? it's actually quite phenomenal, subhanAllah. You'll find that there was a conference uh, you know, where, where some German embryologists you know, said that the embryology of the Qur'an or the way that the Qur'an mentions the states that we come to being, um, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions this, you know, the, the way that we come about and how in our own creation there is a sign of God, 
that God takes us from a state of being of nothingness to what we see of ourselves today. And then once again, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala puts us in a state in which we are um, in which we we return to him. So if you look at verse five, it's a very, very uh, long piece where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions our creation from dust, from nothingness to dust, to drops of fluid, to becoming uh, you know, blood clots, to becoming lumps of flesh, some of us being formed, some being unformed, so some people actually being born, some people not being born. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentioning uh, you know, the way that we grow when we become human beings, recognizable human beings, and so on and so forth. And how eventually, after we've reached full strength, we either die young, or Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, we are brought back into a state of complete dependence. So, you know, either we, we, we die young, or we grow to become completely dependent, like when we came into this world. You know, when you came into this world, you were completely dependent, you rose to a state of independence, and if you live long enough, you're reduced once again to a state of dependence. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us to really focus on ourselves and focus on the creation of ourselves and see in ourselves the, the magnificence of God and, uh, and you know, the, the proof of Allah's creation and the proof of God's creation. In verse 11, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمِنَ النَّاسِ مَنْ يَعْبُدُ اللَّهَ عَلَى حَرْفٍ فَإِنْ أَصَابَهُ خَيْرٌ اطْمَأَنَّ بِهِ وَإِنْ أَصَابَتْهُ فِتْنَةٌ إِنْ قَلَبَ عَلَى وَجْهِهِ Khasira uh, dunya wal akhira. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and there are some people that worship Allah on an edge. Harf is literally an edge. Okay? In the previous surah, in Surah Al Anbiya, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, people are hasty. Alright? In this surah, Surah Al Hajj, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, some people worship Allah on an edge. If good comes to them, then they'll stay in the religion. If bad comes to them, then they'll jump off the cliff. They'll, they'll literally jump off the cliff. And Ibn Abbas عنه, he says that there were some people that accepted Islam, they became Muslim. And as soon as they became Muslim, right, they were expecting wonderful things to happen in their lives. But when they went back to their tribes and they went back to their people and they found that they had harsh circumstances, they started to wonder, what is this religion? Why isn't it giving us what we want in this world? And Allah is telling us in the previous surah, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will, will, will send you what He sends you and goodness will come to you um, when it's time. And a person should not focus on those things. Okay, Don't focus on the goodness of this world or on success in this world or on what's, what appears to be failure in this world. But instead, focus on that which comes in the next life. And people that worship Allah on the condition that life is going to be good as they see it are eventually going to fall off the cliff and they will jump off and they're going to find themselves completely confused in regards to their spirituality. Uh, verse 26 through 29, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala mentions Ibrahim alayhi salam. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and when we showed Ibrahim alayhi salam, makan uh, al-bayt, uh, we showed him the place of the house before the house was even built, before the Kaaba was even built, that this is the place where you need to raise the foundations. Why? Because... This is the first house in which God was worshipped, in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was worshipped. And, you know, and, and, and so Ibrahim alayhi salam is being told to raise the foundations once again. لِلْطَائِفِينَ وَالْقَائِمِينَ وَالْرُكَعِ السُّجُودِ That, you know, for the people who make tawaf around the Kaaba, for those who stand up in prayer, and for those who prostrate and, and humble themselves to God. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, that Ibrahim was told, Abraham was told, وَأَذِّنْ فِي النَّاسِ بِالْحَجِّ يَأْتُوكَ رِجَالًا وَعَلَى كُلِّ ضَامِرٍ يَأْتِينَ مِنْ كُلِّ فَجٍ عَمِيقٍ And proclaim to mankind the pilgrimage. And they will come to you on foot, and on every lean animal, and from every deep and distant wide mountain to every valley. They are all, they're going to come from all over the place uh, to respond to the call that you are making. لِيَشْهَدُوا مَنَافِعَ لَهُمْ And they will bear witness to the uh, to the goodness for themselves and they will mention Allah's name in the days that have been specified and so on and so forth here the the, the beauty of this is that Ibrahim alayhi salam you have the imagery right you've moved to Medina now and you don't have Mecca anymore you're not seeing the pilgrimage anymore you're not seeing Hajj anymore and Ibrahim, and now you're being given this image of Ibrahim alayhi salam standing next to the Kaaba and no one is with him Right, except for his son Ismail. So Ibrahim alayhi salam having no worshippers around him and being told to call and people will come. 
Call and people will come to make this pilgrimage. And this is extremely powerful and extremely beautiful. Because the believers have been forced out of Mecca and now they're being told to remember when Ibrahim Islam was standing next to the Kaaba and saying, Ya Allah, where is my voice going to reach? Why should I call out? And Allah says, just go ahead and make the call and I will deliver your message and people will respond to your call. And this home that you have built for the sake of God will be populated. People will come to bear witness to the, to the oneness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and this place will fill up with believers. And so this is a message to the believers that the dream of Abraham is not lost. The vision of Ibrahim alayhi salam is not lost. So focus on the vision, the dream of Ibrahim alayhi salam and things will come to you and you will see you will see that one day you will return to that house. You will return to fulfill the vision of Abraham, fulfill the dream of Ibrahim alayhi salam. And subhanAllah, this is the, the only surah in the Quran, by the way, uh, it's the first surah in which we're called Muslims. The first surah where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala calls us Muslims. If you go to the last verse of the Quran, وَجَاهِدُوا فِي اللَّهِ حَقَّ جِهَادِهِ And strive for the sake of Allah with the striving due to Him. هُوَ اجْتَبَاكُمْ وَمَا جَعَلَ عَلَيْكُمْ فِي الدِّينِ مِنْ حَرَجْ He has chosen you and He has not placed upon you in the religion any difficulty. مِلَّةَ تَأَبِيكُمْ Ibrahim. This is the way of your father, Abraham. He is the one who named you Muslims before in former scriptures. So you have been called Muslims. You've been chosen to be Muslims like Abraham, which means you submit yourself to the will of God. Muslim, literally, you submit yourself to the way of God. So this is the first time we're called Muslims. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, and it is in this revelation, in this revelation, لِيَكُونَ الرَّسُولُ شَهِيدًا عَلَيْكُمْ that the messenger will be a witness upon you and you will all be witnesses upon mankind. If you look at this, subhanAllah, this beautiful, this beautiful vision of Ibrahim السلام, and the sign of Abraham calling out who's going to respond to this call of submission to God. And this, the first time we're being called Muslims, the first time we're being called amongst those who submit, like Ibrahim السلام, إِذْ قَالَ لَهُ رَبُّهُ أَسْلَمْ قَالَ أَسْلَمْتُ لِرَبِّ الْعَالَمِينَ when Allah told him to submit, he submitted himself, uh, to, he, he, will, he willfully submitted himself to the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And what we also see here is that this is the only surah in the Quran, Surah Al-Hajj, in which the sajda is, uh, comes twice. So we have two verses of sajda here, two verses of, um, of, of prostration. This is the only surah in the Quran which shows you submission, 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 prostrate yourself. You know, uh, sub humble yourself to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Do not be hasty. Goodness will come to you. And uh, avoid, you know, uh, impatience that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala warned against in Surah Al-Anbiya. Instead, focus. You're now in this new stage in Medina, but Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will fulfill the dream of Abraham, the dream of Ibrahim Islam. You will return to that house. You will return to the Kaaba, declaring the greatness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And things will change for you. Things will look up. So that's that concludes the 17th uh, juz. So I'm about to finish up and I'm about to uh, ban uh, James. So thank you for joining us, James, uh, today. I appreciate all your comments. Uh, and uh, yeah. Jazakumullah <laughs> khairan to the rest of you for tuning in today. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.